eight. Good morning. It's been a few months since I've recorded on this uh, series of videos on the biography I wrote of Gordon H. Clark, the Presbyterian philosopher. And I actually um, didn't forget about the series, <laughs> nor was I so much lazy, although I was rather busy the last few months. The actual issue is that it was um, so warm that here in my office, I was needing to run my air conditioning unit, which would have made it too loud for the recording of videos. So now that it has cooled down in the fall, my very favorite season, we can continue and will today on chapter nine, uh, the Butler University years. I think I just mistitled it in the um, YouTube um, prompt. I'll have to go back and title it chapter nine. I think I said chapter 10, but uh, that's that can be fixed later. i um, trying to think if there's anything else to mention. Um, we are looking for an intern with our mission work on the Appalachian Trail. You can see more about that on our webpage, discoversola.com, on the blog post there. And I'm wearing my cool new Sangre de Cristo Seminary shirt. Not very many of us, but uh, wear it proudly. So I will read this chapter this morning, and then I'll go fix my title, if it allows me here on YouTube, to call it Chapter 9 rather than 10. I think, well, we could probably get through the whole chapter. Chapter 9, The Butler University Years, 1945 to 1973. First, I have a quote from a guy named David Clyde Jones I had talked to briefly, um, and he said this, to those of my generation, college undergraduates, 1955 to 1959, Dr. Clark was the philosopher hero of the post-fundamentalism evangelical renaissance. So we'll begin. A fresh start at a secular university. The controversy over Gordon Clark's ordination in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church was still ongoing when he began teaching at Indiana's Butler University in the winter semester of the 1944-1945 academic year. The professorship position had opened up due to the retirement of Elijah Jordan, 1875 to 1953, who taught philosophy at Butler from 1913 to 1944. Originally intending to stay at Butler for only a short period, Clark remained there 28 years, from 1945 to 1973, during which time he wrote prolifically, detailing his own Christian philosophy and criticizing both secular and religious philosophical rivals. Butler was founded by the Disciples of Christ, a Christian denomination, but the university had long since ceased to have any religious affiliation. It was, for all practical purposes, a standard secular American university. Butler had, a, had prestige as a private university with scholarship of its own, but it certainly did not have the reputation of Clark's alma mater, the University of Pennsylvania, nor did it produce the Christian scholars of the fundamentalist Harvard Wheaton College, where Clark had last held a regular professorship. Though Butler University was non-religious, there was a small, independently run Butler School of Religion on the same campus. The Butler School of Religion, however, had no impact on Clark, nor did he have any involvement or interest in it. In fact, disparaging the neighboring school in a letter to Carl F.H. Henry, the editor of Christianity Today, Clark described it as, quote, about the most radical place imaginable and noted, it seems most improbable that anyone faintly evangelical could be appointed to any position there. Well, if something was radical in the 70s, you wonder what, uh, probably be pretty tame compared to what we're dealing with 50 years later. As Butler was a secular institution, Clark did not have any theological battles to fight, as was the case at Wheaton College. There were no separatists making waves like Wheaton's Professor Thiessen, oops, uh, making waves like Wheaton's pr President Buswell, or complaints from zealous Bible teachers like Wheaton's Professor Thiessen. Although Butler was peaceful in these regards and consequently provided Clark with a beneficial atmosphere in which to continue his writing, 
It came at a price for him, as there were few Christian students for him to mold into scholarly defenders of the faith, as he had done at Wheaton College. Without many Christian students interested in his teaching, it seemed he would perhaps live out his backup plan of becoming a Plotinian scholar. Clark had written a few years previously about this plan while considering leaving Wheaton. Of course, spurred on by the events leading up to his resignation at Wheaton College and the controversy surrounding his ordination in the OPC, the beginning of Clark's time at Butler was the turning point in his scholarship. It was at this point that he began to put into writing his own Christian philosophy, rarely again writing on ancient Greek philosophy, with the exception of Thales to Dewey, a popular textbook on the history of philosophy published in 1957. There is no better example of Clark's Christian philosophy than his seminal work and magnum opus, A Christian View of Men and Things, published in 1952, which broadly addresses his view on a number of topics. In his books, Clark's constructions of a Christian view often consisted of just a few brief pages following chapters of refuting other philosophies. He was at his best when critiquing non-Christian philosophies, having a thorough understanding of them from his years studying secular thinkers at the University of Pennsylvania. His refutations of secular and often religious thought were presented first in his works with the intent of clearing the room for a presentation of the Christian alternative. He dealt with the primary philosophical alternatives prominent in his day in books on Dewey, 1960, Karl Barth's Theological Method, 1963, William James, 1963, and The the Philosophy of Science and Belief in God, 1964. Clark's own Christian philosophy was given a fuller exhibition in A Christian Philosophy of Education, 1946, A Christian View of Men and Things, 1952, What Presbyterians Believe, 1956, Religion, Reason, and Revelation, 1961, and Three Types of Religious Philosophy, 1973. Now, a new section, Teaching at Butler. Part of what must have enticed Clark to accept the position at Butler University was the fact that, in addition to his job as professor, he would have autonomy in directing the philosophy major as chairman of the department. However, the department's faculty at the relatively small university never grew beyond just Clark and at most two assistant professors. The professors who taught in the department during Clark's tenure included William Young, 1918 to 2015, Thomas M. Gregory, 1920 to 1993, Robert Crafton Gilpin, 1920 to 1983, and Bernard Baumrin, born circa 1935. Both Young and Gregory were contacts Clark had from his time in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Young, who taught at Butler from 1948 to 1955, had been involved in Clark's ordination controversy in the OPC. He had not signed the original complaint, but his name appears on a later complaint, which argued that the previous General Assembly, 1945, ought to have declared that the Presbytery of Philadelphia had erred in failing to find ground for the original complaint against Clark's ordination. Despite opposition to Clark on some issues in the ordination controversy, Young's name was included on minority reports in support of Clark's positions at the 14th General Assembly of the OPC in 1947. Gregory, who taught at Butler from 1948 to 1952, had been ordained in the OPC in 1947, despite some apparent resistance to his ordination, possibly related to his views on the Clark case. He, like Clark, left the OPC in the wake of the controversy, transferring to the UPCNA. Gregory later attended Clark's alma mater, the University of Pennsylvania, earning a PhD in philosophy in 1958. As chair of the department, Clark was in charge of designing the curriculum. During his tenure at Butler, he added new courses to the philosophy department, increasing the department's offerings from eight courses in 1945 to 17 by the time of his retirement in 1973. Yet throughout his years at Butler, the core curriculum remained relatively unchanged. 
in addition to core courses on the history of medieval philosophy and on ancient philosophy, there were two courses on logic and later a course on the theory of knowledge, each specialties of his. All the courses remained 400 level or below as there was no graduate program in philosophy. Most of Clark's classes remained small. One former student commented that with Clark's general lack of emotion, a chill pervaded the classroom. Despite this chill, some students were genuinely affected by Clark's faith. Former student Chris Williams recalled, the approach that GC took to the believability of the Bible had an almost instantaneous effect on me. His clarity and rigor of thought, as well as his boldness, was completely disarming, and I found myself accepting the truth of the scriptures without much resistance. Other characteristics of Clark as a professor can be seen in the recollections of former Butler student Ed Harris, who recalled, whenever we had exams, he would leave the room to go play chess with, his, with the relig religion professor, Dr. Andre. And I remember very well the last final exam I took from him. The blue book exams were three hours long, and he only asked one question with three words, summarize the course. Another Butler student and star halfback on the university's football team, John Floyd Brown, enrolled in Clark's philosophy courses, not because of any desire for religious indoctrination, but because they were challenging. Brown recalled thinking at the time, I can play football, that's easy, but Aristotle is interesting. According to Brown, Clark would sit back while he and another student debated philosophy vigorously. Brown recalled, in class, Clark would let a student go on a tangent, and then when they were really proud of themselves, he would get a twinkle in his eyes, just knowing what was coming next. And then he'd hit them with a one-liner, which showed they didn't know what they were talking about. An anomaly in Clark's philosophy courses as an African-American, John Floyd Brown was also recalled that for Clark, color had nothing to do with intellectual progress, but how you thought did. If Clark had any prejudice at all, it was not against it was against athletes, something Clark himself certainly was not. Brown took five courses from Clark over the years he studied at Butler and visited Clark's house a number of times, but he never mentioned to Clark that he played on the football team. Brown recalled every book where Clark had to make a bad point, he'd use an athlete. I didn't say anything for years. In my senior year, at my last game, the paper had a picture of me. Dr. Clark saw the paper. He looked at the paper, and then he looked at me and asked, is that you? And it was. We had quite a laugh, because all this time, he talked about athletes as dumb dodos. It is not difficult to see that Clark had a profound influence on many of his students. Even after his resignation from Wheaton College in 1943, his influence continued to be perpetuated there through the beliefs and behaviors of his former students. For example, a 1950 visit by Clark's former student, Carl Henry, to the Wheaton campus, and Henry's description of his own time as a student of Clark aroused the interest of D. Claire Davis, a freshman philosophy major. After reading Clark's A Christian Philosophy of Education, which he found fascinating and crystal clear, Davis transferred to Butler in 1951 to study under Clark for two semesters. Of this time, Davis recalled, my experience at Butler was simply invaluable. I would humbly say, evidenced by my showing later in the graduate record examination in philosophy in the 99th percentile. The best course was one on epistemology using Brand Blanchard's Nature of Thought. Blanchard was worthy of Clark's mind, and the interaction between the two in class was just amazing. But in general, the caliber of student in his classes was not very high. And since GHC was a master of the Socratic method by drawing out students with probing questions, and since most students there didn't have that much that could be drawn out, he was seldom able to display his Socratic skill. After taking nearly all of Dr. Cor Dr. Clark's courses at Butler, Davis returned to Wheaton. When Davis sought ordination in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, his history as a student of Dr. Clark prompted his presbytery to thoroughly question him on the topic of the incomprehensibility of God. Davis recalled that the majority of the questioning was on this one doctrine. By taking a moderate position on the incomprehensibility of God, he passed the interview. 
Davis later became a professor at Westminster Theological Seminary, teaching church history there from 1966 to 2003. During Clark's tenure at Butler, he received a number of accolades. He was promoted to full professor in 1949 and won the Holcomb Award from the university for his teaching in 1951. He helped found the Evangelical Theological Society in 1949 and was a member of its first executive committee and helped draw up the society's belief statement. Quote, the Bible alone and the Bible and in its entirety is the word of God written and is therefore inerrant in its autographs. He was elected vice president of the, that was unquote, <laughs> he was elected vice president of the Evangelical Theological Society for 1964 and then president for 1965. He was chosen to be the moderator of the 138th General Assembly of the Reformed Presbyterian Church General Synod in 1961. Finally, as the commencement speaker in 1966 at the Reformed Episcopal Seminary, he was awarded a doctorate, an honorary doctorate of divinity degree. Although he found himself fitting in more comfortably at Butler than he did at Wheaton, Clark was nevertheless still regarded highly by many at Wheaton. On the invitation of Wheaton College's professor Arthur Holmes, Clark returned to Wheaton to give three lectures in November of 1965. The lectures consisted of a critique of secular philosophy and a construction of his Christian worldview from the axiom of revelation. These lectures were later published in 1968 in Clark's Festschrift, The Philosophy of Gordon H. Clark. Oh, early like here. I haven't even had my coffee or breakfast, but the mind seems to work best in the morning, so it's a good time for this. Let's continue with the next section here, church and denominational involvement in Indianapolis. Clark's activities and responsibilities were not limited to his work as a professor at the university. He also was actively preaching and teaching in the church, as well as contributing to a variety of national periodicals and newspapers. When the Clark family, Gordon, his wife Ruth, and their two daughters, Lois and Betsy, moved to Indianapolis in 1945, they first joined Covenant Orthodox Presbyterian Church. The pastor of Covenant, Martin or Marty Bond, was in sympathy with Clark's position in the ordination controversy. When Clark left the OPC three years later, he and his family joined the United Presbyterian Church of North America, the UPCNA. And on October 14, 1948, his ministerial credentials were transferred to their Presbytery of Indiana. Many of the other pastors who left the OPC in the 1940s joined the Presbyterian Church United States, PCU, PCUS. But this denomination was primarily located in the southern states and so was not an option for Clark at that time. In 1949, the year after Clark switched denominations, Marty Bond also left the OPC for the UPCNA. Covenant OPC Indianapolis soon after became one of the casualties of the ordination controversy, officially closing on October 20, 1952. According to Clark's daughter Betsy, Quote, my dad never complained about the OP church. I grew up with a very high estimation of that church. He never expressed, and here she laughed, any emotion about it, unquote. Also, according to Betsy, her father never spoke about the OPC ordination problem in their daily lives, although her mother had been furious regarding the situation. Clark and his family joined First United Presbyterian Church in Indianapolis, a member church of UPCNA, pastored by Reverend Clarence Paul Blecking. Clark led Bible studies at the church, preached as a substitute pastor, and preached at, a, at various other UPCNA churches within the Presbytery in central Indiana when called upon. The UPCNA had originated almost a century earlier when immigrants from Scottish seceder and covenanter denominations came to America in sufficient numbers to warrant the formation of their own churches. The majority of the seceder and covenanter churches united as a single denomination in 1858, forming the UPCNA. The denomination originally had conservative convictions, including the exclusive use of psalms and singing during worship service, 
But over time, the UPCNA deviated from its roots and began to accept more and more liberal theology. In the 1950s, when the transition of the denomination to liberalism was sufficiently thorough, the UPCNA sought a merger with the liberal PCUSA, to Clark's dismay. <laughs> Reverend Blecking at the First, Presby First United Presbyterian Church did not put up resistance to the denomination's decision to merge with the PCUSA. Clark, who often preached in Blecking's absence and who had a better understanding of what was at stake, was decidedly opposed to the merger. It was the PCUSA from which Clark had left at the formation of the OPC in 1936. He certainly did not want to be brought back into that denomination through a merger. Clark wrote to Carl Henry, with the hope that there might be sufficient resistance within the UPCNA to prevent the merger. Quote, this week, I received some good news about the UP Church. The men opposing union are slowly beginning to move, and we have made one important convert, the editor of the denominational paper. If we can pick up 200 votes out of a total of 1,300, we shall safely have won. But it is the hardest thing in the world to get the UP ministers to do anything except pure routine, unquote. Ultimately, the effort was to no avail, and the UPCNA voted in favor of merging with the PCUSA. On May 28, 1958, the two denominations officially became one. Looking back later that year, Clark wrote to Christianity Today, calling the merger, quote, another defeat for the Christian faith, unquote. Clark's local church, however, managed to avoid the merger. In a sudden turn of events, Reverend Blecking died of a heart attack on Easter Sunday morning, April 21, 1957. This happened just as the congregation was preparing to vote on whether to stay in the UPCNA, which was joining the PCUSA, or switch to another denomination. With Reverend Blecking's death, Clark was appointed stated supply for the congregation. Under Clark's leadership, the church left the UPCNA and joined the Reformed Presbyterian Church General Synod a small conservative Presbyterian denomination. The congregation stated its reasons as follows for rejecting the merger. Quote, the Presbyterian Church in the USA ordains men who do not believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, the virgin birth, the substitutionary atonement, and the resurrection of Christ, and considers them ministers worthy of all confidence and fellowship, unquote. It is perhaps ironic there that they are arguing... <laughs> For the problems in the PCUSA saying that they ordain men that do this. Today, of course, the PCUSA ordains women, and I'm sure they would ordain people who thought they were neither men nor women. So you can see the how absurd it has gotten in that denomination. Okay. Um, continuing. These reasons clearly hearken back to the five fundamentals of the fundamentalist modernist controversy, which ca caused Clark to leave the PCUSA for the OPC in the 1930s. Clark was unanimously received into the ministry of the Western Presbytery of the RPCGS. The local congregation itself was renamed the First Reformed Presbyterian Church. Soon following Clark into the RPCGS were two former OPC pastors and close associates of his, Franklin Durness and Richard Weiler Gray. Within a year, the small denomination nearly doubled in size. When the Clark family became members of the denomination with the name Reformed in its title for the first time, Clark's younger daughter, Betsy, then 15 years of age, was unfamiliar with the use of the term of the word as it applied to a church. She recalls saying, quote, Daddy, you don't want to go to a Reformed church. That sounds like a prison. Troubled kids go to a Reformed school, unquote. Fortunately for Betsy, her father was a master of explaining confusing concepts. Unfortunately, however, the little church had far bigger problems in its future than confusion over name changes. Switching from one denomination to another brought difficult circumstances to the small church. On June 28, 1960, the Indianapolis Presbytery of the United Presbyterian Church, formerly the, of the UPCNA, filed suit against the congregation to recover the property. The local presbytery of the UPCNA had given the congregation a quit-claim deed a few years before the merger. This deed gave the property on Park Avenue in Indianapolis to the congregation. However, when the congregation broke away from the denomination, 
the newly formed Presbytery of Indianapolis of the UP USA initiated legal action to recover the deed. Initially, the congregation prevailed in the case. Then an appeal was filed by the UP USA. Although the congregation eventually lost the case, they had already relocated from Park Avenue to a new facility on Allisonville Road in the north part of the city. The church property dispute was finally decided in favor of the UP USA at the Court of Appeals of Indiana. In the court case, the Presbytery of Indianapolis, etc., versus First United Presbyterian Church of Indianapolis. The loss of the property was a financial burden to the congregation, but with the support of some large donations, including one from the Clark family, the congregation remained solvent. The congregation made do without winning back the old property. Clark preached every Sunday for over eight years until the church grew in members sufficiently to afford a full-time pastor. One of the members of the church and a student in Dr. Clark's Sunday school classes were called. As much as Ruth Clark was vivacious and outgoing, her husband was pensive and reserved. Although his preaching was not of the fire and brimstone style, and um, some might describe it a bit dry, he did, however, choose his words very carefully and did not go too deep theologically where it was difficult for new Christians to follow, nor would I say he was feeding the listener pablum. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's good to see a few people watching here. I'm super popular, two viewers, Alpha and Omega Reformed, hello to you, and Daniel as well, hello. Um, maybe someday I'll actually do like a channel or conversations. If I can get my, my good friend Eric Nieves to come on with me, we can talk about Jonathan Edwards and Gordon Clark someday. That's a, a project we're just beginning. I was thinking here at the beginning what else is going on in life. And one of them is Eric Nieves and I are attempting uh, boldly to go where few men have gone before and read the entirety of Jonathan Edwards' works. And um, so far, I've made it about 20 pages, and I need to get working on that. So, okay, well, let's finish one project at a time here, continuing here in the book. Clark enjoyed the preaching, but the administrative duties of the church wore on him. He was a busy man in these years. Not only was he simultaneously teaching full-time at Butler and leading the church, but he was also busy writing books and making regular contributions to a number of Christian periodicals. His former student, Carl Henry, was the editor for many years at Christianity Today and frequently sent requests to Clark to write articles on a variety of topics. During this time, Clark also wrote a number of articles for the Southern Presbyterian Journal, including a series of articles explaining the doctrines of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Yet Clark still made time to minister to his flock. His patience was displayed to one church member who recalled that Clark once sat down to lunch with him and answered his questions on the doctrine of predestination for three and a half hours. Members of the church also recalled Ruth's dedication to the church community. Among her efforts, Ruth helped take care of an elderly couple, even going to their house and washing their feet. Although Gordon and Ruth Clark were dedicated servants of the church, they welcomed the change when, in July of 1965, the Reverend James Ransom accepted a call to the church and relieved Clark of his preaching and administrative duties. In the same year, 1965, Clark was involved in arranging a merger between the RPCGS and the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, EPC. This is, I would note, the earlier EPC, not the, the group known by that same name today. The EPC was the larger branch of the 1956 division of the Bible Presbyterian Church, itself having originated in 1937 from a division of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. In 1961, this branch of the BPC, called the Columbus Synod, renamed itself the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, holding this name from 1961 until the 1965 union with the RPCGS. The, the new merged denomination took the name Reform Presbyterian Church Evangelical Synod, RPCES. 
The merger with the EPC brought to the newly combined denomination J. Oliver Buswell, Clark's longtime friend, who had originally hired him at Wheaton College almost 30 years prior. Also from the EPC came Francis Schaeffer, a Christian apologist and founder of Labrie, a Christian ministry in Switzerland. Actually, I'm not, I wrote that there, but I, I wonder if Schaefer had already separated himself from their um, denomination. I might be wrong there. Furthermore, the EPC brought into the merger Covenant College and Covenant Seminary. The merger would prove to be beneficial as the new denomination grew in the subsequent years. Next section is life outside of work. As Clark became increasingly comfortable in his position at Butler University, he was able to settle into a routine in both his professional life and in his personal life. In the Clark household, uh, there was almost constant quiet. If Gordon was not studying, he was playing chess or napping. He studied diligently and deliberately, planning out his studies far in advance. In addition to teaching full-time and writing books and articles, he maintained continual correspondence, often on difficult theological matters. Besides regular business letters exchanged with Carl Henry, Clark's correspondence was most frequent with J. Oliver Buswell. Extant correspondence between Clark and Buswell consists of 149 letters written between 1933 and 1962. Though he was not afraid to speak his mind or convey his thoughts regularly through letters and publications, Clark was nevertheless reserved. His wife, Ruth, on the other hand, was hospitable and outgoing. She managed the household's activities and frequently entertained guests, many of whom were students of Clark. She, were known, she was known to be an exceedingly kind woman. The Clarks all had sharp minds. Former Wheaton student Genevieve Long related memories of Ruth speaking French, standing on the sidewalk at Wheaton, and talking to a girl from a diplomat's family. Additionally, Long recalled her sister once having said, quote, Mrs. Clark is smart enough to be the president of the U USA, unquote. During the Butler years, Ruth taught as a substitute teacher at a number of high schools in Indianapolis, including a full semester at Short Ridge High School. Dr. Clark regularly even, even achieving some notoriety. In 1960, he received a plaque for being champion of a local Indianapolis chess the King's Men Chess Club. Among those with whom he frequently played chess, sometimes in person and sometimes via mail, were Dr. E. Robert Andre, a religion professor at Butler, Robert Strong, a Presbyterian minister, John Harper, an attorney friend from Clark's youth in Philadelphia, C. W. Ephraimson, an economics professor at Butler, and later J. C. Keister, a professor of physics at Covenant College. Clark often used chess as a means of fellowship with other students and professors, even if the matches were generally one-sided. One account of Clark's chess prowess given by family friend Tom Jones is worth quoting at length. I bumped into Dr. Clark back in the late 60s when he was visiting his daughter Betsy on Lookout Mountain, Tennessee, where Betsy taught at Covenant College. I knew he was a chess champion and suggested that it would be fun to play with him sometime. Eager to do so. And later that week, he dropped by our home for an evening of chess. My wife had gone shopping and left me at home with our two small children. We played two games. In the first game, I thought I did reasonably well for about half an hour. But then, rather abruptly, the entire left side of my board seemed to collapse, and Dr. Clark swept me away. So we played a second game, in which he defeated me unceremoniously in about ten minutes. Feeling properly humiliated, I asked a question. Dr. Clark, I want to learn from you, so tell me if you will, in that first game, I thought I did fairly well for a while, but then you just clobbered me at the end. Can you remember anything about where I made my mistakes? With that, Dr. Clark proceeded to set up the first game and replay the entire thing. He reached a point where he said, now at this point, I expected you would move your queen thus so, at which point I was prepared to counter with my knight, like so, and then... With this, he made about six hypothetical moves, which he had anticipated. But you didn't do that. 
he said as he put all the pieces back in place. Instead, you moved your rook over here. And with that, he finished the game, explaining each move in the swift demise of my game. It was by now at least 45 minutes after the first game had been played, and he had remembered every single move in that game. I was amazed and thoroughly in submission to the master by now. But the thing that humiliated me the most was that the entire time that we had been playing, he was holding my four-year-old son, Bradley, on his lap and was reading a storybook to him. He would glance up after my moves, take a brief look at the board, make his move nonchalantly, and go back to reading the story. He had not even been paying attention, or so it seemed. What a mind. Unquote. As a college professor, Clark often had the summers free from his regular work. He always kept busy, but he and his family still made time for vacations. They, in, starting in May of 1954, the Clark family went on a four-month visitation to Europe. They stayed a month in Paris and a month in London. In between, there were visits to Lausanne, Lucerne, Heidelberg, where Clark had studied in 1927, Amsterdam, and Edinburgh. On the trip, they visited l'Institut Biblique in Paris, run by M. Jules Marcel Nicole, the brother of Roger Nicole of Gordon Divinity School, and the Emmaus Bible Institute in Switzerland, where they met with the Swiss theologian Dr. René Pasch. The family also regularly vacationed in Arizona, New Mexico, and western Texas, where Clark spent much of his time painting, painting landscapes of the surroundings. He filled numerous speaking engagements during these trips. In the summer, starting in 1958 and continuing most years until 1969, Clark taught two long seminars at the Winona Lake School of Theology in Indiana at the invitation of their president, John A. Huffman. One of Clark's students there was Erwin Lutzer, today the senior pastor of the historic Moody Church in Chicago. Lutzer recalled taking a couple of classes at Winona Lake School of Theology under Dr. Clark, including one in which he turned out to be the only student in the course. For this course, Lutzer worked with Clark one-on-one -on -one to review the latter's yet-to-be-published manuscript of historiography, secular and religious. Lutzer credits Clark as a significant influence on him. He wrote, Clark's em emphasis on logic aroused my philosophic mind to think through certain issues from a rational standpoint. And he also increased my understanding of Calvinism and solidified many doctrines that I had already come to accept. Yet Luther found Clark's philosophy ultimately difficult to reconcile with the world in which we lived. According to Lutzer, because of his disdain for empirical evidence, I felt his epistemology ultimately was lacking. I studied with him during the summer of 1969 when Teddy Kennedy's car ran off a bridge and Mary Jo Kopachekny drowned. Dr. Clark was grousing about the Kennedy family and the, this incident. I said to him, how do you know that this incident happened since it is based on empirical observation? He answered, I'm willing to go on insufficient evidence. It was difficult for me to live with such a rational approach to all knowledge. Unquote. Although Gordon Clark's public image and reputation revolved around his academic and philosophical accomplishments and battles, he was still just a man. He valued and loved his friends and family, and in some ways was like many other men of his generation. He owned a home, had a wife and children, and pursued hobbies. He had his own peculiarities. For example, he compartmentalized his food, eating one entree or side fully before moving to the next. He loved chocolate ice cream, devoured Scrapple, a pork, cornmeal, and spice dish popular in Pennsylvania, and for health reasons, drank Postum, a powdered roast grain beverage as a coffee substitute. Clark even owned a dog for a time. The dog, Zephy, short for Zephaniah, was a gift from his daughter Lois and her husband Dwight, a chaplain in the U.S. Navy who, together with Lois, had been sent to Guam on a two-year assignment. In 1962, the small standard dachshund was put on a train in Albuquerque and picked up by Clark in Indianapolis. Zephy remained a beloved member of the family for more than a decade. In 1959, Clark received a visit from this is a new section, 
Carl Bart and the Volcker Fund. In 1959, Clark received a visit from a representative of the Volcker Fund who invited him to submit an application for a grant. The Volcker Fund had been established in 1932 by William Volcker, a wealthy businessman, to underwrite a number of charitable causes in the Kansas City, Missouri area. Following Volcker's death, his nephew, Harold Lunhau, expanded this fund's mission to include support of free market economic theory and contributed money to conservative and libertarian authors. Clark was awarded a Volcker Fund grant, which funded a sabbatical during the 1961-1962 school year for him to write a book on the theologian Karl Barth. This book was to be a refutation of Barth's theology. Sensing the importance of this topic and the efforts Clark put into his writing, Carl Henry wrote to Clark with great expectation, quote, I trust 1962 proves to be your best year yet, unquote. <clears throat> Clark's study and writing on Bart was just in time for what turned out to be Bart's first and only visit to America in 1962. Bart gave speeches on his theology that year at both Princeton Theological Seminary and Chicago University. Clark attended the Chicago event. Cornelius Van Til was also a theological opponent of Karl Barth, and like Clark, Van Til was working on a book against Barth's theology. In a letter to Henry, Clark expressed joy when he found out from Henry that publication of his own book on Barth would precede Van Til's. Clark wrote, P.S. So I beat Van Til in the race to publish. Good. Unquote. Clark's book, The Theological Method of Karl Barth, made it to the printers in 1963, and Van Til's Christianity and Barthianism came out the following year. Although Clark and Van Til were not on the most cordial terms, Clark sought to avoid any new conflict. When Henry asked him to review Van Til's book for Christianity Today, Clark responded with his own idea, one likely to exhaust the energies of two other Christian thinkers and give himself a good laugh. He wrote, quote, I too have Van Til's book on Bart. So far I have read only 30 pages. Why don't you get Buswell to review it and get Van Til to re review Buswell's theology? That would be a malicious combination, would it not? Unquote. Next section, Clark's comedy. Although caricatured as a strict logical professor, Clark was also known for his comedic wit often to the surprise of those who would expect the professor of logic to not have a funny bone in his body. Sometimes he used comedy in explaining the principles of logic. In one recorded lecture, Clark said, quote, The law of contradiction requires that a word have a definite meaning, meaning. Now if a word has all possible meanings, it means nothing. Suppose there was a word in the dictionary, and you looked it up in the dictionary, and the meanings were all the other words in the dictionary. Suppose the word were automobile. The word automobile means cat. It means tree. It means the square root of minus one, and so on and so on. In order to write a book, all you'd have to say is auto, 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 auto. And that means... The New York Yankees are going to win the pennant in the World Series next October, unquote. Emotion, which Clark was often accused of lacking, was a topic that sometimes led to comedic situations. Former Covenant Seminary professor or president and WTS professor William Barker recalled, That leads me to a story that I have only secondhand, but reported to me by a credible source, namely my brother Nick. Nick, a professor of English at Covenant College and something of a poet, made a presentation to a faculty forum meeting at which he argued for a proper use of emotion in Christian art by referring to George Frederick Handel's manuscript of the libretto for the Messiah as having tear stains on it. Dr. Clark, congratulating Nick after the discussion, said, the stains were not from tears but from sweat. Two final pages here. I gotta, I gotta do some other work, but we'll get this done first. Some of Clark's comedy was not intentional, but was the product of his philosophical views. For example, in 1958, Carl Henry sent a letter to Clark saying, quote, 
Our news editor tells me that he recently asked you for 50 words of commentary on the projected U.S. shot to the moon. Your own comment was a bit facetious, indicating that you could find no significance in the event. On other occasions, Clark would refer back to philosophical examples in his comedy. In a lecture where he had explained the paradox of Zeno, which intends to show that motion is impossible, Clark joked about his publisher's slowness, saying, well, I guess we need a definition of faith or something. How do you distinguish between saving faith and temporary faith? If you will wait a year, as I have already done, my treatise on faith and saving faith will be printed. But oh boy, Craig, publisher Charles H. Craig, of Presbyterian and Reform Publishing, is the slowest person on earth. He would have pleased Zeno the Eleatic with his exhibition of no motion. Unquote. Finally, as seen in a chapter on eschatology in his unpublished Systematic Theology, Clark used humor to take jabs at his theological opposition. Critiquing dispensationalism, he wrote, quote, Another indefensible aberration of the dispensationalists is their insertion between Revelation 3.22 and Revelation 4.1 of a rapture so secret that there is no reference to it in the whole Bible. Clark's wit was in many ways typical of an intellectual, somewhat biting, often sarcastic, and always sharp. For those who would claim Clark was somber and stern, there is plenty of evidence that Clark could crack wise with the best of his peers. Next section, Clark's daughters. Despite all the work at the university, writing books and pastoring churches, Clark still made regular, regularly made time for his family. His wife and daughters were especially dear to him. Both of his children married ministers. Clark's elder daughter, Lois, married Dwight Zeller, who was then a chaplain in the U.S. Navy. His younger daughter, Betsy, married Wyatt George, who pastored PCA churches in Illinois for many years. Lois married a few months after graduating from Butler in 1956 with a bachelor's degree in French and German. Her father had hoped she would go to France to study, but the marriage temporarily put an end to her academic work. As a chaplain's wife, she was able to use her musical gifts, serving as an organist in many military chapels during her husband's career. She also taught piano lessons to children of service members and to others in years afterwards. Her academic background prepared her for positions teaching French and English for two years in New York and subbing in schools in Pennsylvania and Colorado after leaving military life. Lois and Dwight are the parents of six sons and two daughters. When Dwight founded Sangre de Cristo Seminary, Lois taught the church music course every third year for 30 years and completed a Master's of Divinity degree in 1985, a few months after her father's death. In fact, she recalled studying Hebrew for class at her father's bedside in his final days. In addition to the music jobs, she served as the librarian for the semester. Lois married young and admits that it was her father's wish for her not to do so. He would have preferred that she continued her studies. Clark's hopes for a scholar daughter then shifted to his younger daughter, Betsy. Betsy followed a more ambitious career, academic career. While her father was still teaching at Butler, Betsy earned there a bachelor's degree in French and German in 1962 and a master's degree in history in 1966. Her master's thesis was titled, a History of the Reformed Presbyterian Church. Then, <clears throat> blazing the trail that Lois declined to pursue, Betsy went to France to study at Institut Biblique de Nogent, which made her father very happy. Along with her husband, Wyatt, who served three pastorates in the PCA, Betsy raised four sons. Later in life, after teaching at multiple institutions, Tudor Hall in Indianapolis and Covenant College, where she met her husband, Betsy earned a PhD in history at Southern Illinois University in 1996. She taught French, Latin, and church history at Trinity Christian School in Carbondale, Illinois, and served as school principal until her retirement in 2015. And then one short conclusion. Clark ultimately spent the bulk of his career at Butler University, being isolated there as a Christian thinker. There was no chance of him failing into groupthink on theological matters, as it can be the case when working in a denominational seminary. 
his own collegiate training, already unusual for a theologian, having studied philosophy at a secular university rather than theology at a seminary. And this isolation at Butler both contributed to many unique theological conclusions. Some of these conclusions are detailed in the following chapter. And indeed, we will get to that chapter next. Um, one note of interest, um, Betsy's, Betsy Clark, George, her dissertation is hopefully soon to be published. I've just given an endorsement for it. It's called Animal Afterlife, and she explores um, sort of a historical overview of the views of theologians and various thinkers on that question of whether animals uh, have souls and whether they will be in heaven. Um, so very interesting book coming up. So maybe you will see that from whip and stock in the next year or so. I believe that is all for today. M much, um, much other work to get on with, but as I mentioned earlier, check out on discoversola.com on our blog if you know of anybody, especially a seminary student, who could be a good intern for us in our mission work and with some opportunities to preach and teach here at the church as well. Uh, we are just busy all the time, um, plenty of work to do, and uh, we have funding behind it, so that's helpful as well. So I pray all of you are well. Always glad to hear from anyone on these theological topics, which I've not been able to keep up with as much as in past days, just busy with church and family and other things, but always fascinating. And maybe someday I'll get around to my life dream of writing a book on epistemology. Um, hard to do the subject um, justice, just a complicated, endless discussion. But I will end there and pray that you all have a great day. God bless.